What's up, everybody? Welcome, welcome to another Monday night rookie roundtable call. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for taking the time out um, to join us and to and to spend your precious time here with us tonight. Um, we have a really, really amazing special guest joining us here and probably the main reason why most of you guys are here, right, to hear what this man has to say. But before we get there, just a couple um, things I wanted to share. First, every single Monday night, 7 p.m., this goes down. And the invitation for everybody here, one is to A, turn your camera on, right, because this is going to give us the opportunity to see who you are, put a face to a name. And also for our speaker to be able to see who you are. Um, oftentimes, I know that when I'm speaking here, being able to see somebody's face actually gives me momentum, gives me a certain level of energy. So having the ability to see you guys, you know, I, I would love if you're, you know, you can to turn your cameras on Two, um, we all know that uh, there when, when I'm speaking, when we're speaking, most of us don't really even hear the words that are coming out of our mouth. There is a filter in which we listen to everything from, right? So the ask for everybody today is that you suspend your own perceptions, your own judgments about anything, and you put that aside so that you can actually listen from a space of curiosity and imagination, okay? It doesn't, it's not about you knowing the entire formula of what you have to do. But what you need to have is a belief, a belief that this vision, that somehow you can sit inside this vision and that this is financially, this financial freedom, financial independence is possible for you as well. So be here, not like, oh, what am I gonna get from it, right? But be here like you are the, you are the person that is gonna determine what value you are gonna get from this call. Now, Brad is here with us, the apartment king. He is definitely going to share a lot of amazing nuggets, and I'm going to bring you up, Brad, in a second here. Um, but that's the way, that's the invitation for everybody, right? And I'm also kind of just going through this a little bit so that we give more people the opportunity to hop on so nobody misses anything that uh, gets shared when, when Brad is brought on. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is... Uh, if you're here, you can also snap a picture. This is this is my Instagram, my social media plug uh, for everybody is take a picture of what's going on of this of this room right now, right? And you can tag people on here. When you tag people, you create new connection. People get to know who you are. You make a new Instagram friend, a new follower, and uh, and also it's just some kind of, some content that you can put out there, right? These calls are great because. If you have friends and family that you are getting into the real estate space and, you know, most of the times people hold you to your past. So it's like, man, why can't my family just, you know, believe in me and invest in the deals that I'm doing when today's my first day doing multifamily, right? Or my first time doing real estate. Why won't people just invest with me to get them onto the same mindset? It's very simple. You bring them onto these calls. You have somebody talk about it. It opens their mind a little bit. And now you guys are closer on the same page and you might be able to do deals together then, right? So inviting people to these calls, really, really a uh, smart strategy for you. And, you know, it makes this room more valuable for everybody too. Because what we're going to do here tonight is first, we're going to have a conversation with Brad. I'm going to pick his brains. I'm going to, you know, I'm really going to dig into some of the, some of the, uh, the, the formula of creating financial freedom. And, uh, and then we're going to have, uh, we're going to have a breakout room. So this is something really cool that we do is we break everybody out into uh, small rooms, five, six people. We have a set of questions. Okay. Icebreaker questions that gives you guys the opportunity to really meet each other. Now, on these Monday night calls, I'm going to say that there has been partnerships, business partnerships created inside this breakout room, okay, on this call right here. People have gotten together, bought deals. People have gotten together, created other Zoom calls. They have done all of these things um, because of meeting somebody here. If you are here, you are not here by accident, okay? It is definitely divinely orchestrated that you have somehow put yourself here with the people that are here 
There is no accidents of all the billions and infinite possibilities out there that you are here at this specific time with these people. There is somebody here that you're meant to meet. All right. So when we break out into the rooms, look for that. Look for who's this person that you have to meet. Okay. And, and you don't need to meet everybody. Just meet a couple. Alexa, stop. So that's the agenda for tonight. I don't want to waste any more time. I think we've given people enough time to hop onto this call. I'm going to bring Brad up here. He is the apartment king. He has helped hundreds of people become millionaires, become financially free. He has, uh, he has an amazing mastermind. He's running a seminar coming up. So we're going to talk about everything. But besides all of that, Brad is one of the most philanthropical, philanthropical people that I know personally. Okay, I might have pronounced that word wrong, but you guys know what I mean. So let me bring Brad up to the front. <clears throat> and, uh, and and let's 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 start this call. Everybody's here for you, Brad. What's up, brother? Welcome, man. Hey, how you doing? Can you hear me good? Yeah, we can hear you good. Good. Yeah, I'm on the. I'm in my guest house now, and don't have my fancy <laughs> camera and microphone. So hopefully, you can hear me okay. Yeah, we hear you good. You're always styling, man. You're the most stylish person I know. You got the best style. Hey, man, I'm just in Florida wearing beach clothes right now. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. So, um, you know, can you just share a little bit of your story first? Today, we're definitely going to tap into, you know, your why, why you're doing what you're doing. And we're going to go over, you know, some of the philanthropy things that you do. And then also, I think what everybody wants to know is what you put on your website, which is, let me teach you how to become financially free in five years or less investing in apartments. So we'll get to that, but let's share with the audience here a little bit of who you are in case you guys don't know who the apartment king is. Yeah, well, hey, first of all, it was Robert Helms with the um, real estate guys that gave me the nickname apartment king. He actually brought <laughs> me on stage and said, the king of apartments and then we shortened it to Apartment Kang, but it was his <laughs> idea, but it stuck ever since then. It's been like four years. I love so, it. Um, yeah, man, it's like, I just say never in my wildest dreams, like I knew I would be financially free, right? Like I, like so many people maybe listening, hey, everybody, it's great to be here, by the way. I'm so glad to see what 82 people that's on and I'm really happy to be here on a Monday night and just let's just chat, you know, let's just talk about things that matter to you guys. And Alex, I'm here for you. And I'm here for everybody here tonight. So I'm really, really excited. But I think the thing I want to share the most is like, like so many people that are probably on tonight, and I recognize a lot of faces and names, is that, you know, my, I wasn't born with money, um, got a job, studied hard, got good grades. That's what my parents taught me went to college, got a degree, um, struggled in corporate America, man. I was not a top corporate guy. I was kind of average. I came in late. I left early. I took my lunch hour and I went on vacations. And then I wondered why I didn't get promoted. And then my boss said, well, you got to come in early. You got to stay late. You got to work through lunch and you don't take your vacation. And I'm like, man, that ain't, that ain't, that ain't the kind of life I want to live. So like, I hopped around different companies trying to climb the corporate ladder. I was fired once. I was laid off once. Uh, I was not the model employee. I went back and got an MBA and tried to be the model employee, but I just had a really hard time. How many people could relate to what I'm saying? I just had a hard time fitting into that corporate, you know, that corporate eight to five or nine to six thing. And coming in early, leaving late, working through lunch, not being ashamed for taking vacation. Like if anyone else could relate, just type in yes. Yeah, there's a lot of people that are already doing it. So yeah, I've been fired several times. Say, look, if you've been fired several times, I can tell you have you, well, everybody has what it takes to, to be, you know, a, a successful real estate investor. So like how I got started was back in the year 2000, I read the Rich Dad, Poor Dad books. And I just want to tell you, like, those books gave me so much inspiration and motivation um, to go out and seek education. Because Kiyosaki says in his books, he's like, you know, go into specialized education, like conferences and seminars and masterminds. They can earn you a fortune. 
and go into formal education will get you a job. <clears throat> That's right, Jada. You have a copy at your desk. I love seeing all the chats, by the way. I'll try to interact with y'all that are putting the chats in there. And so like Kiyosaki inspired me. And, and I used to say like his books changed my life. But let me let me tell you something. Reading a book and getting information doesn't change your life. Reading a book and getting ideas could only change your life if you take action. So like, I'm guilty of this. I read a lot of books, but I don't take action. But I read the Rich Dad books and I took action. And the action I took was I went to real estate investing seminars <clears throat> back in 2001. And I learned the ABCs of of single family rentals and multifamily rentals. And that's how I got started, man. And I and my first investment property was a 32 unit deal. So after I learned the basics of single family rentals and multifamily rentals, I decided that that I could start in multifamily. And that's something that like people need to hear because um, I'm not saying multifamily is better or worse than single. I mean, I think it's better than single family. So I guess I'm saying it, but like, Look, you can make a lot of money doing anything if you're committed, if you're educated, if you're committed, you can make a lot of money in a lot of different asset classes. But I selected multifamily because it made more sense. It's more scalable. You know, you could buy a business. And if you remember the cash flow quadrant, there's ESBI. And Kiyosaki talks about being a business owner and an investor. And so when you buy an apartment building and you can hire a management company, you know, and you could raise money from other people to buy bigger units or bigger properties and hire companies to run them. You're more of a business owner instead of trying to do everything yourself, which is like, you know, buying the deals, renovating the deals, collecting the rent, going to court if you need to evict somebody. Personally, being, you know, so hands on, that's not really scalable. So, like, I went right into multifamily. Back in 2002, that was my first property. And since then, I've switched over to a syndication model where I like to buy bigger deals, raise money from other people. And I've, I've syndicated almost 10,000 units in the, wow. last, in the last like decade. So on your first deal, did you use your own money to buy it or were you in syndication mode from the start? Well, I did use my own money. And how I got it was... See, look, until I read Rich Dad books, like there's Brad before 35 years old and there's Brad after 35 years old. And it's two different Brads. It's true. Mm -hmm. the, the Brad before I was 35, you know, I saved my money. I lived below my means. You know, I had a job. I had two degrees. And one of the things that I did is I lived below my means. And so I, I worked in corporate America from the time I was 22 to 35 and I saved money. I had a 401k. I mean, it's, I'm kind of laughing at myself now, but I had like a 401k and, and I would change companies. I rolled over to an IRA and I, I would say I had a financial planner that would have me saving 10% of my money into a savings account and investment account. I mean, I did all the middle-class trap stuff, you know? And so I had a couple hundred K um, by the time I was 35 and I used that money. I actually used that money to buy my first two deals. I bought 32 doors and then I bought 30 doors. And that's why I switched over to syndicating because what happened is I used my own money to buy 62 doors and I was out of money. And then a broker brought me a 250 unit deal and I just saw the light, you know, like the old me would have been like, I can't do that deal. I don't have any money, but I was already like, I was going to networking events like y'all. And, you know, I was hustling out there and people knew me that I had 62 units and um, people would say like, Hey, Brad, if you find another deal, I'll put money in with you. So I find this 250 unit deal. And I raised, uh, I raised $2 million from 27 people. But see, I, I, I didn't find the deal and need the money and then start networking. When I did these 62 units, I did, it took me 18 months to do 62 units. 
I was already going to networking events. People already knew me. I was already, you know, working it. So I was building up. And this is important for people to listen to. When you get started, as you're learning and as you're getting, you know, you're learning the ABCs and all that type of stuff, you also want to be going and building up a network. If you just wait until you find a deal and the gurus say, oh, you know, if you find a good deal, the money will come. The money won't come if you haven't been putting yourself out there. So that's why it's important for everybody to constantly be investing in yourself and going to networking events and conferences and, you know, and, and building your network so that when you do find a deal, you'll have people that you could show it to. Mm. So how yeah. does, you know, today is much different from then. $2 million is not going to get you to a 250, 250 door uh, unit property. <laughs> <laughs> and a couple hundred thousand dollars not going to get you a 30 unit or a 32 unit. So for everybody, it's kind of like, you know, that couple hundred saved up. Most people will still have it around that number. How do they how do they get into the game now? I really want to know this formula, maybe that you've, you know, mm -hmm. you, you've sharpened and you've created for people. What do people need mm -hmm. to do now? Like networking? Yes, I think everybody, yeah. everybody gets the importance of that. What's next? Well, look, the number is just get bigger, you know, but it's like the I'll, I'll, I'll answer that by using an example. Let's go. Okay. So like an example deal that I would tell any of my students and I would tell anybody here, there's 98 people here now is that anybody here could do a $10 million deal and I'm going to give you the breakdown. So like, you know, in the old days you would need, two and a half million of equity because the lender would loan you 80% and then you might need some closing costs and upfront fees. And so you need two, two million down payment, some closing costs and stuff, and you need two and a half million dollars and you get a seven and a half million dollar loan. But today you're going to need $4 million of equity because the lender isn't loaning as much money because interest rates are higher. So that's one of the challenges that we have today, by the way, is like there, there, there's less on that $10 million deal, instead of getting an $8 million loan, you're going to get a $6 million loan. Okay, so you need to learn more to raise more money, which is why going to networking events and conferences is even more critical now, because you need to keep expanding your network and building credibility. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that $10 million deal? Well, you need $4 million. So let's say, you know, you said, hey, that, you know, a lot of people still have $100,000, $200,000. And, and I tell my students this, and some people just don't believe me because it's it could be hard to believe if you're hearing it for the first time. But when you get around enough people that are doing it, it becomes more believable. And I like what you said, Alex, in the beginning. You said, hey, put your own filters aside and just know that it can be done. And, and even if you say, oh, I can't do that, like I can't raise $4 million, and I'd say, well, what if you can? Maybe you can't right now, but what if you can within 12 months from now if you really commit and apply yourself? And, and Sean, I'm so glad you just typed that in. Sean Griffith just typed in the chat box. It can most definitely be done. And Sean is one of my students who have done it. And and Alex, I didn't know Sean was going to be on this call. And I didn't either. <laughs> Sean, maybe Sean, you, maybe Sean knew I was going to be on it because maybe he saw your advertising. But like Sean came into my group and he's done multiple syndications now, and he's done multiple deals. So three or Sean, type in the chat how many deals you did. Six deals. Type in the chat the size of your first deal that you did. 86 units. And what was the price? 12.4 million. See, that was that was his first syndication. It was a 12.4 million dollar deal, 86 units. So and, and Sean had Sean, what was your previous experience? Like before you did multifamily? Did, were you doing single family? Were you doing real estate? Like what were you doing? Passive investing. So like, look, it helps 
the the way that I teach Alex, it's it's pretty simple, is that you invest in your education, you network. Um, how I started is I I went to a seminar and I invested in a mentorship program. And there's there's various programs out there. Obviously, I have one of those programs. Um, but by look, you pay either way. You pay with your time trying to figure it out on your own, or you pay with your money where you can leverage somebody else's, like in my case, 23 years now of experience, where you could just go faster. You just go faster, collapse time frames, make less mistakes, and leverage the somebody that's already walked down the road before you. And it's really as simple as that. And and you need to be like, you need to be part of a network, part of a community. So like the way Sean raised money for his $12.4 million deal is like in my community, we have over a thousand people. And so it's not difficult if if you if you work those relationships with those a thousand people when you get to know, like, and trust them, and then you find a deal it's more likely that you're going to have people that want to invest with you. And I say more likely because look, I'm not, I'm not here to like puff smoke out of up anybody's ass. It's like you, you get out of it, what you put into it, you can join, you can join any mentoring program out there and not do the work and you won't get results. You won't. Okay. It doesn't matter if it's Grant Cardone or Tony Robbins or Brad Sumrock. It's like, or Alex, it's like, you got to put in the work. And, and your mentor and your coaches are going to tell you the work that you need to do. You need to show up. You need to be prepared. You need to know what you want. You need to be articulate. You need to, you know, hone your communication and networking skills. Um, get, sometimes get out of your comfort zone. Um, but if you're willing to do those things, then you'll be successful. So you have first, you got to invest in yourself. You'd be a part of a network. You know, and you got to raise capital, but you got to be able to raise the capital. What, how do, what is the formula to financial freedom though? You know, like wh where, where does somebody realize or can actually be like, okay, I see that financial freedom is now possible. How does that, how does monetarily, like, how does that start to come in? To yeah, that's a great question. And, and I, and again, I always like to give examples. Good. Um, so everybody should have a financial freedom number. OK, and that's a number that only you could determine. I can't tell you what your number is. Now, if we had a one on one consultation, I could tell you what your number is. But like I there's 101 people here right now. I can't tell you what your number is. But so for me, and I could tell you how to come up with your number. If you have a job, how many people here have a job right now? Just blow up the chat. If you have a job, type in yes, like job, J-O-B, who's got a job? Job, yes, yes, okay. If you got a job, if you're currently able to live off of your income, like I had a job and I made 10,000 a month and I was able to get by. I mean, I had a little bit left over, not a lot, but I was able to pay my rent, you know, go out to dinner, go on some vacations, buy some nice clothes. I, I didn't have a luxurious life, but I had a, a pretty good lifestyle, you know, or what I consider good back then. And so my number, my financial freedom number was 10,000 a month. And what that meant was once I hit 10,000 a month from my apartment investments, you know, some people call it passive income. It, it's not passive. The, the fact that you're here tonight means it's not even passive because if it were a passive, you could just be sleeping and doing nothing. So you, even as a passive investor, you're, you're showing up, you're getting deal flow, you're getting access to people doing deals. So there's always a little bit of effort required. So I call it investment income rather than passive income. So like hmm. when your investment income meets your job income, then you can walk away from your job. Okay. And still have your same lifestyle. So there's, there's different, there's different levels of financial freedom. But to me, the first level is like, what's your income? And just just like if you play the Kiyosaki cash flow game, you know, you start over here. Uh, how many people played the cash flow game? You start down here in the in rat your race goals to get out of that rat race to get up here. And and so you pick a card and your card might be a plumber 
that says you make 2000 a month or your card might be a doctor that says you make 20000 a month. So whatever profession you pick, you got to build assets and cash flow to meet that number. And so everybody's going to have a different number. Okay, so mine was 10K a month. And, and so that would be the first step, Alex, is what is what is your financial freedom number? And I'd like to ask everybody, like, without without going into the minutia of doing all the math, how many people know what their financial freedom is number? Like, what's the, and it, and it, and it grows. Like, at first, my, at first mine was 10,000 a month. Now it's like 100,000 a month. Like, I, like, I don't want to say it, but I, I, I don't know how I can live on less than 100,000 a month now. And I don't mean to be bragging or, you know, whatever, but it's like when, when you, when you earn more then you, you know, you eventually like you, you, you take on a, a higher quality of life style. So my question is how many people know, <laughs> are, are you laughing at Sean's comment, Alex? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I am too, by the way. I saw it. I'm like, Sean, my motherfucker. Okay, so, you know, um, if if you know what your financial freedom number is and you want to share it, like type it in. Like, let's, let's, let's see what everybody's number is. You know, what's your number? That would be the number that you could walk away from your job. So I'm just going to read some out loud here. I see 10K, 20K, yeah, per month. 10K, 10K, 20K, 10K. Um, 10k, 12k, 20k, 15k, 50k, 5k. Yeah, these are great. Okay, so the first step is you got to know your number, and then from there, then you could start figuring out like, well, how many units do I need, you know, or how many, you know, and then if you're going to syndicate, then you get paid more than if you just you do. If you syndicate, you get paid more than if you do your own deal. It's a fact because syndicators you you know and i'm not advocating that you 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 um you do it for the fees you do it because you know you want to help communities and you want to help investors but as a syndicator you there's different ways you get paid so you could get acquisition fees you could get a disproportionate percentage of the profit say for example let's say you know that on that 10 million dollar deal and I need to raise $4 million. And let's say I only put in 100K. So I put in 100K and I'm going to get out my calculator here. What's what's 100K divided by 4 million? 100K divided 2 by 4 million is 2.5%. So let's say I put in 100K and I need 4 million. I own 2.5% of the deal based on my equity contribution. But the way I'm going to structure that deal is I'm going to say, hey, because I'm doing all the work, I find a deal, analyze the deal, raise the money, fund the deal, manage the asset, deal with the investors, handle any nuances. If there's insurance claims, fires, hurricanes, whatever happens, it's I'm taking care of it. I am running this company. I'm running the business. And y'all are going to invest with me and trust me to do that. So I might only put up two and a half percent of the money, Alex, but the way I'm going to structure the deal is I'm going to say, hey, look, I'm going to get 20 percent of the profit. And you all get 80 percent of the profit. So listen to that. I put up two and a half percent of the money. But I'm getting 20 percent of the profit. That means I get 20 percent of the cash flow and 20 percent of the sales proceeds. So how many people think that's a good way to leverage your return? If you're a passive investor, you put up 2% of the money, you get 2% of the deal. If you're the general partner and you put up 2% of the money, you get 20% of the deal or however you structure it. And so this is why I, 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 I like to explain this very clearly. You know, I know Grant Cardone. I like Grant Cardone. I'm not associated business-wise with Grant Cardone, except... I've been to his events and he's been to mine and that's it. But when he talks about 10 X in your money, it's because he is doing all the work and the people that invest in Cardone capital are not doing the work. So the, the, the people that invest in Cardone capital or the passive investors, they're not 10 X in their money. And I'm not saying anything derogatory about it. It's just a fact. Like, you, you don't 10x your money by being a passive investor. You 10x your money by being 
on the other side by being on the general partnership team. So that's the way that you accelerate your returns. Does this, does this make sense, Alex? And to everybody oh, yeah, out there, of course. it makes sense. To me, it definitely makes sense. But I think one of the things that people will have challenge with is how do they even get onto the general partnership side, right? Like to take down a $10 million deal, it requires more than just, hey, I got, I'm going to raise $4 million. There's a lot of other, other obstacles. So how does somebody even get to a team, right? <laughs> if I was a first time general partner, I wouldn't even want to be the general partner because I got so many people. I'm responsible for everyone's money and this is my first time. So what would you say for people like right now, there's a, probably a lot of newbies on this call. How do they even get into that possibility of 10xing their returns <clears> as a general partner? Yeah. So look, there's some steps that you would want to take. So there's a couple of ways. One, I'm going to give you a couple of options and I'm going to give you the one I think is the best. So one is you could do it like I did. I bought smaller deals with my own money and built up a track record and confidence. But honestly, that took a lot of time. And knowing what I know now, I would have not started. It took me three years to do 62 units. And then when I got that 250 unit, like if I knew then what I knew in the beginning, or you know, if I knew that I could do the 250 units, I wouldn't have done the 62. I'm serious. Like I would not. Okay. It's three years of my life. The, the other way you could go is you could start as a passive investor and you could get confidence that way. And that's a route that a lot of people take. But I could also tell you that like <clears throat> the single biggest factor that determines people's success is their level of commitment. It's, it is. It's their level of commitment. If you stay on the outside and you just stay on the periphery, and you know, you go to free meetup groups and you read bigger pockets, and you're not really putting yourself out there and you're not investing in yourself. Like, did you go to a three-day weekend? Did you get a mentor? Are you like committed? Like, what are you doing? You're you're gonna find it harder. But for the people that are like, hey man, I'm I'm all in and I'm investing in myself and I'm committed. The single biggest thing a new person could do to be on the GP team is to find the deal. Because let's say that, let's say, Alex, that you're doing a deal and you already found it. Well, why would you bring in a brand new person onto your GP team? Now, there's a couple of reasons why. You might say, hey, I need some help securing the loan or I need so I need a net worth partner or I need some help raising the money so I need a capital raising partner but there's nuances around that legally that I'm not going into tonight but bottom line is uh, an experienced GP might have a reason to bring in an inexperienced GP if that inexperienced GP could add value like by doing some of the work you know and I you know, the work could be the asset management, the construction management, the securing the loan, the raising the equity. There's there are different things that an experienced GP might need, and he might just want to help somebody. Like I do that all the time on my deals. I brought in inex inexperienced people that are my students, partially just because I want to help them. But I can't I can't do that for everybody because I might have hundreds of students and only a couple deals at a time. Okay. But I can tell you, and I, this is what I tell my mentees, is if you want to guarantee that you're going to have a GP position, go find the deal. And here's a perfect example. One of my students found a 50, not 15, a five zero million dollar deal in Nashville. It was way too big for him to do on his own. But he found it. And then he brought in two people that had a lot more experience that helped him raise the money, get the loan, get the deal awarded, manage the deal. I was one of those people. And he brought in two other people that were like two or three, you know, steps above him. But he found the deal. So what I'm telling, I tell all my new students, and I'll tell everyone here tonight, if you want to be on a GP team, go find the freaking deal. Call the brokers. 
pick three markets or pick a market, call the brokers, analyze deals, teach yourself how to analyze and underwrite deals, find the deal, make the offers, get a deal. And then you start saying, hey, who do I know that can help me? And you call the Alex Lovelies and the Sean Griffins and the Brad Sumrocks and all these people and you and you pull them into your deal. But then what you got to realize is you can't do the deal without them. Like the guy that found the deal in Nashville, the $50 million deal, you know how much he kept to the GP? He kept 25% for himself. And he gave 75% to me and another guy. And you might say, well, that's stupid. He found the deal. He did all the work. And he gave away 75%. And it's like, yeah, but he got 25% of a $50 million deal that he never, ever, 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 ever would have gotten on his own. And it's at the table for him because now he's a player in the market and all the brokers are like, <clears throat> he was their guy. I was, I was just the guy that came in to help him get the deal done, but he's the guy that had the broker relationships. You know what happened next? The brokers are like, oh, Randy closed this $50 million deal and now they're bringing him more deals. Awesome. Wow. I mean, th that is how it starts. There's so many stories like that. I mean, there's countless stories mm. of that's how people got started. So now I think another one of the challenges people have looking for deals is, you know, especially maybe in today's market, brokers will give you more time. But, you know, maybe a year ago when brokers were too busy, mm. right, they were like proof of funds, you know, certain things like that, just to even get the financials or anything like that. How did they even start to get brokers to take them seriously? So the question is, how do how do you get you, brokers to take you seriously? Yeah, well, so so Alex, you're you're absolutely right. Is that right now is a different game than before? So just like I said, there was Brad before he turned thirty five, and Brad after. There was the apartment investing business before the Fed messed everything up. And the apartment investing business after the Fed messed everything up, which is where we're at right now. So before, it's like it was a frenzy. It's like, you know, if you were new, the only way that you had a chance to succeed is you needed a really strong person on your team for credibility. Mm -hmm. And now you have a better shot but it still helps to have an experienced team. Like it always helps, okay? But now like, here's an example. The deal that was selling for 20 million is now selling for 15. And the deal that was selling for 20 million would have 30 buyers making offers on it. And that'd be eight in the best and final. Let me, let me repeat that. Prior to the, rise in interest rates when interest rates were three percent the deal would be on would be selling the broker would say the, the the buyer wants 17 million for the deal but it wouldn't sell at 17 it would be bid up to 20. so the broker again the broker would say the whisper price of this deal is 17 million but there'd be so much people going after it 30 40 people going after it that drive the price up to 20 million and that'd be 30 offers and then eight would be in the best and final. Now that deal is gonna sell at 15 million, not 20. And there's gonna be three offers and they're not even gonna do a best and final. And brokers will be a lot more open to working with newer people. Now, that being said, you still got to perform and you still got to know what you're doing and you should still have an experienced person on your team. And, you know, I'm not going to mention any other groups, but some of you may be in some of these groups, but like, it's absolutely insane for, I'm in some of these, I, I, I listen in on some of these other groups and it's absolutely stupid. I'm just going to say stupid, insane for a new person to say, hey, I just found an 800 unit portfolio and who wants to go in on it with me? Like, nobody's gonna sell that to you. Nobody. 
And, and, and y'all need to know the truth. So I'm going to here to tell you the truth. But they'll sell you an 80 unit. They'll sell you a 100 unit. They ain't going to sell you an 800 unit class A property. They will not. If you're new and you don't have a track record, they're not going to sell it to you. They're not. Hmm. Yeah. So you shouldn't be looking at those. You shouldn't be looking at 800 unit, $100 million assets when you're new. You should be looking at, you know, a five to $20 million deal, B or C class. And, and that's, that's the other thing, like brokers like that. They're going to be like, hey, this person ain't wasting my time. They're going after a deal that's achievable for them. You still need to have an equity source, you still need to have an experienced person. Because again, like, like I'm selling a $15 million deal right now. And if one of you called me and had absolutely no experience, I, I would not want to give you the deal. But like, if some of you had no experience, but you partnered with Alex, you know, or Sean Griffith, and, and then you sent me the offer together. And, 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 you know, now I know Sean's in the deal and he closed six transactions, or I know Alex is in the deal and Alex has what, 800 units or a thousand units. Like now you have my attention. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's super important. I think really what we want to land is that team and just, just pausing for a second here at the end of this call about in about 15, 20 minutes or so, when we start to break people out into rooms, this is your opportunity to start building those relationships. You know, it's your opportunity. It's, it's, it's why we're really here is because you want to build those relationships. What Brad's going to teach us and what he's going to say to us, yes, it's all great and all, but you're not going to be able to do anything alone, especially if you're just starting. So I think that's one of the most important things that I want to make sure that is landed for everybody, regardless of what your filter is right now, that you can do it and you can do it if you have the right person on your team. If you have a, somebody that's got the money behind you, got the experience behind you, chances are brokers will work with you. When you submit an LOI, you submit some, a, an offer, you want to send the entire team's portfolio and bio over so that they're, you know, because certainty of close <laughs> is probably the most important thing, right? Brad, when, when brokers are considering your deal, they want to make sure that you, you can close. Absolutely. And, and, so, and, and so do I. Like, even, like, like now more than ever, like it's so important like because it's harder to get um look every people might need to know the truth the opportunity right now is real estate is at a 20 percent discount so who's excited about that besides me like let's blow up the chat like we could buy deals now at a discount the challenge is it's harder and it, you know lenders are loaning less money they're more strict you know that the, there's there's investors are it's harder to raise money and, you know, investors or they listen to constant negative news on, you know, CNN and they're, they're, they're getting freaked <laughs> out, you know? And, and so, but for those that are committed, it's one of the best times. Yeah. So, and I've been doing this for 23 years and it's one of the best times. It's a great time, but I, we're, we're looking at a lot of deals too, Brad. Um, are you finding that there's actually a lot of discounts on deals? I feel like people are not really budging and they're still trying to get class B deals out at four and a half, five cap on, you know, on these deals. And I feel like people aren't budging. Well, send some of those people to be, to overpay for my deals right now. I'm selling. <laughs> I like, seriously, like I had, okay, let me just answer that with an uh, example. So like, let's go. At the beginning of 23, I listed three of my properties and they were all 120, 150 unit. You know, the first one sold within 60 days. I got it done, but it went under contract in January and it closed March 3rd. And I got full price, 500,000 non refundable money closed. And then just you know, the Fed just kept doing what they do best, messing things up. And my second deal went under contract in January. And in March, the buyer, their lender backed out. And then they extended the deal to April. And then they extended the deal to May. And they ended up backing out. But I got 300000 of their earnest money. 
because it was non-refundable. And they walked away. And I had them under contract at 17.1 million. And now I have a new buyer and it's at 15.4. But look, I paid 11 million. I mean, I'm still going to make money. So like, don't feel sorry for me, but like I'm selling at a substantial, you know, 17.1 to 15.4 is a $1.7 million discount. Okay. All right. So you guys heard it. My theory, my thoughts. You know, Brad's got an example that is not the case. And that's and, true. We can find those. But let me tell you something else. I don't have to sell, but I want to sell. I am a motivated seller. So, and a lot of the gurus, like, I guess I'm a guru, Alex, but I'm not like the typical guru because I yeah. tell it like it is not, you know, I don't prey on people's emotions and all that shit. Um the gurus say, hey, find a motivated seller. But a motivated seller is somebody that lists a deal with a broker. Like a motivated seller ain't going around being like, you know, I get all these people texting me. Hey, I'm interested in your property on this street. And I just take those texts and I send them to my broker and they're all flippers and wholesalers and nobody has any money or credit. And they, <laughs> they ain't going to buy the deal. They don't have money. They're just trying to, I know the drill. So, you know, I'm motivated because the lender that I have after five years is making me do all these repairs that I don't want to do. You know, they didn't make me do any repairs in 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022 comes around. <clears throat> they start raising, the Fed starts raising the interest rates and all of a sudden the lender inspections start getting really tight and they're up my butt and they're like, well, you got to do this. 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 I don't have the money to do all those repairs. Well, I got the money, but I either have to raise money or I'd have to put in my own money. You know, when you buy a deal and Alex, you know this, but people that are new, when you buy a deal, you buy the deal, you put in your rehab amount, you do your rehab your first one or two years, you don't keep millions of dollars in a bank account. So, you know, you could come back seven years later and do repairs that your lender needs you to do. So I don't want to do the repairs. So I'm selling it. You know, so my option is I, I hold on to the property and do the repairs that I don't want to do, that we don't have the money to do, or I sell it. But that doesn't mean I'm going to, I'm a distressed seller. It's like, I'm still going to create a market. I got three buyers competing and it's a good deal. And it's, you know. <clears throat> awesome. Yeah. Okay. So, you, you know, I hope you guys can take some of these examples. And I love that you're using real life experiences and, and stories to share these lessons. Um, I think they're really valuable. I do want to get to give people an opportunity to ask questions. Um, and then also, Brad, I really want you to share about the, the philanthropy that you do, because, you know, I follow you on social media and we've talked a bunch and I've always sharing about how I love, you know, the work that you do, because everybody talks about philanthropy. Every talk, everybody talks about donating money and this and that. But you're actually like hands on doing it. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that whole thing came about? Yeah. So let me just. I'll, I'll give you the background. Like when I was making 10K a month, man, I didn't think I could afford to give away a penny. Like, and it was a mindset thing. Like I probably could have, but I just didn't think about it. And I, you know, we, we didn't grow up with money. So I never thought I'd be giving money to other people. And then like, you know, we got to a point where we were making, you know, a couple million dollars a year. And then we figured out how to not to pay tax. And my tax was a mil almost a million dollars in 2018. And we got it down to zero. Five years in a row, by the way, tax-free at the federal level, five years in a row, totally legal. And, I, and I'll teach how to do that too. And I'll introduce people to my team on that. <clears throat> but after a while, I just felt like, <clears throat> man, I'm so blessed. And you know, we got things so figured out and I'm so blessed that when we started reducing our tax, 
I was like, we got to do something. And, and my mom just died from Alzheimer's. And um, I was like, man, I got to start pumping money into like Alzheimer's and dementia stuff. And then I was like, but where's the money go? Like I, I, I couldn't connect the money going into these big organizations. And then I, I met a guy that was speaking about how $150 buys a wheelchair for somebody. And they were raising money for wheelchairs and sending them to Guatemala, Nicaragua, Mexico, you know, third world developing countries. And I just got behind it and I got real passionate about it. And, and so we did an event and I told everybody in the conference that for every dollar they put in, I'll match it a dollar. And we put in like, we raised like 20 grand and then I matched it. So we sent $40,000 to this charity, 20 from me and 20 from the event attendees. And the next thing you know, the charity's like calling me up and they're like, Brad, this is the biggest donation we've ever had. And, and we want to invite you to come to Nicaragua with us so that we could, you could see how this wheelchair has changed people's lives. And I'm like, sure, like I'll go. When's the trip? And I'm thinking like next year and yeah, you know, whatever. And they're like, we're going in three weeks. I'm like, three weeks. I, I can't <laughs> go. But I, I did. I rearranged my life and went to Nicaragua. This was in 2017. And man, to see how $150 that for us, and I don't care here, you know, I know I, I'm not bragging, but I know I'm a multimillionaire and I know everybody here ain't. But if you are on this Zoom meeting and you're even thinking about doing apartments, you got a much better life than anybody that can't afford a $150 wheelchair. You all still go out to dinner and maybe you get a nice steak or seafood and a bottle of wine. And you, most of you don't think twice about spending a hundred bucks or $150 on a meal. And when you see how that $150 changes the person that gets a chair that never had one or changes the parents or the family members of the person that's carrying that person on their back like a sack of potatoes and now they could put them in the chair and they have mobility. One chair for 150 bucks changes five to 10 lives because it's their whole ecosystem of caregivers. And it gives that person mobility, it gives them hope, it gives them employment opportunities, it gets them out of the house, they could pursue hobbies. They could have somewhat of a normal life compared to us that don't need a chair. And I just got behind it, Alex, and became really passionate about it. Yeah, that's freaking amazing. That's such a powerful story. So you're hosting a, a really big event coming up, right? Yeah. Hey, by the way, can I ask? People were asking for the link and Alex, we didn't talk about this, but here's the deal. Chairs, inflation has gone up. Chairs are 250 bucks now, but anyone that buys a chair for $250, I'll buy a chair too. And so, um, you know, if anyone want, commits to buy a chair, Alex, if you could just maybe- I'll, you send, know, I'll, send, type, I'll send all of it out for- in Yeah, an email type for in everybody. the chat. I'll get the link over. And for every chair that you guys buy, I'll buy one. Awesome. That's that's amazing. So we're going to definitely, we'll, we'll put that out and we'll send out an email to everybody here. Do you, uh, tell us a little bit about the big event that you're having. And then we're going to ask, answer some questions here from mm -hmm. everybody. Um, and then we're going to do the breakout rooms, guys. So yeah, tell us a little bit a little about, about that. That's where I met you last year. So I, I really enjoyed the event. It was great. AmnatCon, is it? Yes. So the event coming up, okay, I'll, first I'll give you the dates and I'll give you the location and I'm going to talk about it. So it's August 25, 26, 27 in Dallas, Texas. And there's a fourth day bonus, the 28th, for people to buy the platinum ticket. So it's either a three-day event or a four-day event. And this event is a multi-speaker event. 
where I bring in some really good speakers and we talk about some things that matter. Okay, so some of the things that we're going to talk about is like the mindset that we need to have to be successful. We're going to talk about what makes a good market so you can hone in on your markets. We're going to talk about marketing, like how marketing yourself and building a brand matters. Okay, we talk about, you know, money in apartments, like how, how the numbers work, like the cash flow, the upside, the taxes. So we talk about money, mindset, marketing, markets. We talk about mechanics, like management, KPIs, you know, managing deals, managing investors, like the logistics, okay? And we talk about mastery. So there's a lot, those are six M's, okay? Mastery, like commitment and repetition and, you know, modeling and things that skills that people need to, actions and things people need to do to become good at something, okay? And so I bring in some really, really good speakers. So like in the past, we've had Grant Cardone, we've had Ed Milet, we've had Jesse Itzler. Um, so this year I can tell you, I'll tell you everybody that's coming, okay? And, and we haven't even formally announced everybody that's coming. The number one, we're gonna have Robert Kiyosaki, okay? Oh, so Re Robert's gonna be there in person in Dallas. So how many of you, started into real estate because of Robert Kiyosaki. Just blow up the chat. For sure. So Robert's going to be there in person. And he's going to do a special session with the platinum ticket holders. So the platinums get a bonus fourth day. And then they get a special session with Robert. So that's number one. Um, the next speaker we have is... Now, somebody, everyone may not know his name, but he's a powerful, powerful, transformative speaker. Nick Santanastasso has no legs and one arm. He's 27 years old, and he has overcome amazing, incredible obstacles in his life. And I met him at a Tony Robbins event, and he speaks at a lot of Tony Robbins events. And this guy, if you have never heard him speak, he will change your life. He changes the way you think. If you think you have a tough having two legs and two arms, where do you hear from a multimillionaire, 27 year old that's got no legs and one arm? And he's the most confident guy I've ever met. And he's so down to earth and so nice. And he will like change your life. Okay. So he's going to be talking about mindset and overcoming adversity, which honestly, in these crazy times right now, like everybody needs that. Even me, like we're all bombarded with like negativity. And so, you know, Nick is going to be there. Um, Pete Vargas, who's one of the best speaker trainers and speakers on the planet. He works with Grant Cardone and Dean Graziosi. He's helped me elevate my speaking game like 10x. He's going to be there talking about marketing and branding and how speaking matters. Um, we got some really strong industry insiders like John Chang, who's like the number two guy with Marcus and Millichap. Marcus and Millichap is like the biggest commercial brokerage in the United States. And their number two guy in their company is going to be here talking about industry data, forecasting, the Fed. So we cover it all. Okay. We cover marketing. We cover Mark Charlie Young with Madeira Residential who has 20,000 units and is buying up everything right now. Like he's literally buying billions. He's buying more stuff than Grant Cardone. See, every, Grant is an amazing marketer, but there are actually people that just putting their head down buying shit and they're not amazing marketers. And we need to learn from those kind of people too. So it's going to run the gamut. Like we're going to learn from people that have tens of thousands of units. We're going to learn from some of the best speakers on the planet. We're going to learn from some of the best industry data and research types in the in the country. Um, we're going to have Tressa Toddair, who runs like the Women's Real Estate Investor Network. And she's going to talk. She, she is passionate about empowering women that want to invest in real estate. Okay, so she's going to be there. She's got a huge community of like 4,000 women investors. And, and she's going to be on the stage. So it's going to be an incredible event. We're going to cover the gamut. And of course, I'll be speaking in between too. And I'll be talking a lot about what I talk about, which is, you know, 
and I'll tell you what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the opportunity that exists right now and what makes it unique. You know, the taxes, the, the less competition, the buyer friendly terms, the price discounts that we're saying. Awesome. So we're definitely going myself and our community is going to be going, um, you know, it'd be really cool for us all to roll over there together. Um, you know, I, I, I had such a blast over there. Every speaker, you know, this is probably one event where I stayed inside so much more than outside. You know, a lot of these conferences, people just stay outside and mingle the whole time. But, you know, this this event last year was fire. I'm excited for this year. Robert Kiyosaki, obviously, being somebody that I really want to see. So cool. Um, we posted a link in there. We'll send it out to everybody as well, both to uh, donate for wheelchairs and also to uh, get a ticket um, at a discount. We'll send the link and everything like that for everybody. Um, let's let's bring some people up for questions. We'll do about 10 minutes of questions. Anybody have anything? You know, this is your opportunity to kind of chat with Brad, ask him some questions, be known. All right, get get known before you go to the conference. <laughs> yeah, well, let me let me ask this because I know some people, Alex, before you even put the link up, there were people that uh, said like, "Hey, Brad, see you in, you know, Dallas in a month." So like, um, who's coming to the conference, and who's got questions about the conference? Because this conference. Mm. Let me just say this. I've been to a lot of conferences and I've designed mine uniquely that if there's one conference you need to go to the rest of the year, this is the one. This is the one you need to go to. All right. So who's who's got questions about the conference? And also, you know, if you got questions in general, just raise your hand also here. And we'll bring you up to ask. So go ahead, Jeff. Hey, Brad, Jeff Cassell. How are you doing tonight? Hey, uh, I had a quick question for you in regards to um, I own a bunch of single family properties that about 18 of them, and I'm debating it. They're all paid for. And I'm trying to debate on either cash out refinance or oh. just sell them. cash uh, out refinance or sell. Yeah. Well, I'll just tell you what I would do. So number one is I've never had 18 single family homes. So I, I really like to speak about things that I have direct experience in, but I get this question a lot because I, I mentor a lot of people that move in from single family into multi. And here's the thing, like prices are probably down now, right? Or are they? If you sell now, are they lower than what you inherently think they're worth? Like you taking a haircut if you sell. Well, in the in the price range that these single families are, typically you know they're first time home buyer rental type property, maybe a second, a few second homes, but nothing that is you know big rentals, you know nothing that's five thousand square foot or anything like that. All of these are more you know twelve, fifteen hundred, three bedroom, two bath, two car garages, a few that are two thousand one or two that's almost 3,000 feet. But those are the bigger rentals, not very normal. And and the other question is if you, I would just do a sell versus refi, like a spreadsheet, because I'm a spreadsheet guy. And I would just estimate, okay, if I sold each property, what am I going to get out of it? How long is it going to take to sell? You know, you have a tax hickey coming up, right? Like we're we're in July. So if you sell these properties, is there going to be a gain? Are you going to be able to reinvest the money the same calendar year and get the bonus depreciation from doing an apartment? There may you may want to time some of this. Is this making sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, and then if you do refis, there's no tax consequence on the refis, and there still could be a cash flowing asset. And so I would just look at like without doing the analysis, I can't give you the answer. Um, and then you know there could be a timing issue like. What everybody needs to know about apartments is, you know, you, you can't do a 1031 from selling a single family home and investing it into a syndication because that's not a like kind exchange. But if you sell the single family home and get a capital gain, 
and reinvest the money in the same calendar year, then you're going to get a depreciation offset from the multifamily building. So like, just because though of where we're at in the year in July, and if you put the properties for sale and how long it takes to sell them, and then you might need, you know, some time to find a deal to reinvest it to, you, you might want to consider that too. Right. And who do, who's your favorite cost seg company in DFW? Well, the one I use, and look, there's a lot of them and people are like, oh, I'm going to use the cheapest one. Well, the cheapest one isn't always the best one. So the company I use is Engineering Tax Services. And the guy's name is Mike Donofrio. And he does give some rock people, like I feel like he gives them special um, treatment, priority, maybe a little bit better pricing. So if you go to him, just tell him you, you know, heard of him from me. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. We'll see Thanks, you Jeff. Time. Yeah. See you there. See All you right, in Barb. Dallas. Barb's got a question. Go I'm ahead. in Arlington. So I'm the oh, I'm, good. see you in your see you in your neighborhood. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Barb. You gotta unmute. Bottom right of your screen. Is that better? Yep. Yes. Okay. So my question is, um, so many of the mentors talk about um, the capital raising to finding the deal to learning the underwriting. Um, but operationally, once we have the deal, a little bit of chocolate if we become a co-GP on that deal, how do we learn how to meet our end goal of refi in four years and selling in five or seven years? Where, where do we learn that part of it? Well, I'll tell you how I learned that part of it. And you may not like the answer. But I got into deals. It. I said you got it. I got into deals and I figured it out. And and so like, look, I'm 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 gonna level with everybody here. People were like, oh Brad, you teach us how to buy deals, but you don't teach us how to operate them. Well, first of all, that ain't true. Okay. And we have a whole community of people that are operating deals and figure sh figuring shit out, and we're all sharing information with each other. Like, you know, Sean's a great example of that. He's got six deals and we figure things out together and we 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 collaborate and we get on Zoom calls and we talk about operational issues and I bring in speakers and we talk about KPIs and all that type of stuff. But yeah, like I, you could call it, say I'm guilty, but it's like, I focus a lot of my initial education on getting people into deals. And the reason is it would be like saying like, hey, um, you know, I live in Dallas and I want to drive to New York. Um, and so like, you know, once I get into New York, like how do I find the specific address that I'm going to. And I'm like, well, look, you got a long ways to go. Like you got to get in the car. You got to drive from Dallas to Houston and then cross into Arkansas. And then like, like this is a step-by-step -step process. And so, um, you know, <clears throat> you may not like the answer, but it's the answer I'm going to give you is that when people ask, how am I going to manage the deal when you don't even have one yet? I would just say, hey, well, what, what's a better question? But I will say that how we learn how to do it, like how I learned how to do it, is I got into deals and then I surrounded myself with other people that had deals and we learned from each other. So call that a mastermind, call it a peer group, call it a network. Look, people could put a course together on managing deals. And you could watch that course. And I've done a course on managing deals and I've teach, I've taught KPIs and asset management. And I know a lot of people that are trying to teach it, but the person that needs that course is the person that has the deal. Like, I hope that makes sense. And- Yeah, no, absolutely makes sense. Yeah. I just, um, that's, 
just kind of one of the things I think about in the whole scheme of things. It's, yeah. It, and it, so, it's like, part of the process. Yeah. And, like, like, for me, like, the way I do my deals is I buy the deals and I work with the management companies. And so every management company could be a little different. So, you know, it's if um, if there's a certain way that you want to do things, you're going to have to make sure the way you want to do things is, you know, in sync with that management company you hire. Like, for example, some owners want to go to the property every day. And a lot of management companies are going to say, we don't want anybody coming to the property every day. We're going to have weekly calls. So there needs to be like a merger of expectations and 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 mutual um, understandings of how owners and management companies work together. And again, I teach this stuff like I teach it. OK, so um, I hope I answered your question. No, you did. And there's lots of good stuff popping up in the chat. It's just something I, I think about. Um, not that it's in my way of looking for the deal but it's something i think about yeah so yeah. barb I, I think it's going to be really important that a you surround yourself with more people that have experiences you're in communities like this you go to seminars you listen to brad and other speakers that have done it you know share more of their experiences and then when you're in the deal you actually listen from a whole different place when you're actually in the deal See, one thing is trying to understand concepts. The other thing is to take it and apply it. And you're going to learn it in a whole different way. So trust the process and just keep surrounding yourself and showing up to places like this. That's that would be my suggestion for you too, Barb. All right. So okay, we're going to give we're, we're going to give Antoine, Brigida and uh, and Heidi an opportunity to ask their questions. Let's keep it really laser and focused, everybody. And, um, you know, and then we're going to break out to uh, to rooms where you get to meet your special somebody or some peoples. Go ahead, Antoine. Uh, we can't really hear you. Your your speaker set might be muted. Nope. All right, while you test that, Bridgeta, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Hi. Hey, good to see uh, you. Hi, good to see you. Yeah, so. Um, I don't have many questions right now. Um, I am actually very happy to be here today. Um, I missed a lot of these meetings because of uh, JOB. Um, so I'm, I'm super happy to uh, join the group today. And um, I'm getting ready to go to Dallas, Brad. So I'm so happy to, to meet you there. Um, I just have a question. I'm brand new to real estate. Um, I met Alex a few months ago. I'm still learning. Um, I'm going to events, meetups. Do you have any other suggestion to for someone like me who's really new to the business to learn um a little bit easier um, understand a little bit um, better about how the this whole process works because it just i am very patient with the process but it takes a little bit a little bit longer than i thought to understand the whole concept of this so if there's any other suggestions that yes you i do and i would say this you know go through your rounds go to meetups, go to some conferences, including mine. And at some point, you're going to want to align yourself with somebody because um, you'll get different opinions, you'll get different perspectives. But at some point, like you got to, you, you, I don't want to say you got to, but it would be more useful and have more clarity to settle in with one person's framework or approach, okay? And whenever I solicit opinions from multiple coaches or mentors of mine, and I get different answers, I get confused. Yeah. And then at some point I say, okay, who am I gonna listen to here? So that makes, you know, and I'm not like, I'm not saying it should be me or it shouldn't be me, but it's like, who do you resonate the most with? Who, um, whose students do you resonate the most with? Who has, who do you perceive 
is going to give you the most likely chance to succeed based on the research research that you've done or the students that, that you've talked to. And that's what I would do. So like now that you're out there, you're going to want to hone in with somebody that you feel like you can listen to that's going to get you there faster. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Antoine, you. did you fix your you fix your mic yet? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear uh, you. Awesome. Yeah. Antoine Tunu, Austin. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Hi, Brad. Quick question about taxes and insurance. Had a property on the LOI in March. Uh, the state jacked up the prices. The broker was able to reduce it. My investors freaked out because they were like, well, it's going to happen again next year. And we don't know by how much and so forth. Do you have any um, anything to share with us when it comes to strategy for long term and short term tactical strategies to deal with um, taxes and insurance so that we're not, you know, you know fear is the issue at this point. Basically. Well, where are you where are you buying your properties? Dallas, uh, Texas. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about taxes. So taxes, um, you you know, Texas is non-disclosure, so you're always protesting your taxes. And taxes are like a lag effect. So like right now, we're in like a perfect storm on the negative side because for three years, you know, rents were going up so fast and we were making more of this money and values were going up. And then the next year, the tax assessed value would go up. And so what happened like right now is that the market values are going down, but the tax values are still going up because there's a lag effect because it's happening. Like it's kind of like in arrears, you know? So people were getting caught a little bit in the pickle on taxes. Um, but still like <clears throat> every year they raise my taxes way up and we whack, whack them back down and then we litigate and we get refunds, but it might take 12 to 14 months in multifamily. So that's one thing there. So I just say, be patient. And I'd also say in future years, I, th I don't think we're going to see assessed values go up next year. Like they went up this year because this year's assessed values are based on December, you know, 2022 numbers. So next year's are going to be based on 2023 numbers, and we're going to see we're going to see some relief on taxes. And then insurance, I just sat through like this whole presentation on insurance, and insurance has been a big problem. There are um, I never fully understood how the insurance industry works, but do you know that insurance companies have insurance and that's called reinsurers. So has anyone ever heard of reinsurers? And a reinsurer is the insurance companies that insure the insurance companies. And some of these insurance companies have paid out gazillions, billions of claims and they're insurers have gone bankrupt and they've gone bankrupt. So a lot of these people have exited certain markets like Florida and Houston that are prone to storms and even Dallas that are prone to like windstorms and hailstorms. And so because of that, rates have skyrocketed. But I can tell you this, I've been doing this 22 years. Over the long term, by the way, taxes always go up. They don't always go up at the same level and they went up so fast that I think we're gonna see some relief because values have gone down. So I think tax assessed values will go down. But the same with insurance is like, whenever there's a period of heavy claims and insurance companies are suffering losses, a lot of them get out of markets and it's really hard to find insurance and the rates go up. But then what happens in capitalism is over time, and when there's less claims over time, then companies will come back into markets and say, hey, I could insure this building for less than this guy. And then we see rates go down. So I have seen rates go up and I've seen rates come down in insurance. And right now we're just on a big upswing. And so like, now I don't have a crystal ball because it depends on like, how many more storms are we going to have this year? How many windstorms are we going to have this year? How many more claims are going to be paid out this year? And 
you know, the the globalists and the climate change people say it's all due to climate change and it just depends on what you believe. But like, I think we're going to see some, over the last 20 years, we've seen rates go up and we've seen rates go down on insurance. So just sit tight, bro. <laughs> sit tight. And it's, it, it's hard process, right now because yeah. insurance, like we had the perfect storm, like the lenders are loaning less money. You know, cost of materials went up, cost of supplies went up, rents aren't increasing as fast anymore, insurance went up, taxes went up, but it ain't always going to be this way. Like, so to me, if you could get into a good deal at a 20% discount, the taxes aren't going to be as high and the insurance won't be as high at some point in the future. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Last question, Haiti. Welcome. Hey, you hear me well? Yep, we can hear you. Yes. I'm so pumped to be here. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Brad. I'm from Nicaragua, so I'm deeply thankful for what you're doing. My ultimate goal is to go back there when I have my millions and pick up all the kids from the streets from Managua. In another call, at some other point, I'm going to circle back with you to tell me how you overcame the danger and the corruption, but that's another call. My question is about raising capital. Um, and if I narrow it down to, to, to the most concrete question, what is the best move? Um, and I know it goes case by case and every, every person has their own path and their own uh, story. Raising capital, where is the program? Where is it at work? I, I, I know I can do this. I just need to be shown. I'm about to close my first deal and I brought six check writers family and friends, friends and friends. But what do you do when you max out that number of people? I mean, you can, what's the next level? What's the next thing? Like it's a website, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram. Where is it at? I, I know I can do this. I just- Well, there's a lot of ways. Okay, there's a lot of ways. And so like the way I've done it is, you know, when you, when you learn a skill set. Like, I guess one question I have is how comfortable are you talking about apartment investing? Because when you're comfortable about it, then you could go to networking events and you talk about it and you develop credibility. So, you know, think about this, like social media is a tool. Going to a network event is a tool. Having a one-on-one -on -one conversation is a tool. And so people kind of gravitate to where they're most comfortable at. like. Grant Cardone is a great example of somebody who raises money on social media through his brand, his marketing, his style, his level of communication. You know, Charlie Young, that none of you probably ever heard of, is not on social media at all. But he meets with billionaire family offices one on one and raises, you know, $10 million in a meeting. And he's an expert in communicating that way. Um, so I would just say, you know, you find like, you know, I would just say like, do you like being on social media? Do you like creating content? Do you like adding value? Do you have a following? Do you want to build a following? Then go to the social media route. Do you like physically going to networking events and talking to people and building personal connections? Then do that. Um, and some people are like doing, you know, multiple things, but there's, there's not just one way to do it. But if I go far enough upstream, upstream, meaning like, let's take away like social media or networking or a website is at some point, you just have to be very clear in what you're doing and why people should work with you. And that clarity of your message needs to come out on your website it needs to come out on your social media. It needs to come out on your content. It needs to come out in your email blast. It needs to come out in a Zoom meeting. It needs to come out in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. It needs to come out on a one-to-many meeting. And so if you go high enough upstream, it's just being clear in what your message is and your communication. Yeah. Hey, Haiti. So next Monday, you gave me a good idea. You know, I've been asked to give this presentation a couple of times. It's how I raised capital through social media. So I actually have a whole presentation on that next Monday on our rookie roundtable call. I will present that and give you guys a, 
how I have been raising capital. Last year, I raised close to 10 million. This year, about 2 million. So how I've used social media to be able to make that happen as well, share the whole system, things like that. So it's, it's structure that you'll need to have in place. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, so last, last, last question from Tarek. Um, you know, just, I know he really wanted to ask, so I'm going to give him a shot. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Yeah. Hi guys. How are you doing? So I have a question going back to uh, taxes. So when we fight taxes, how much we can reduce it in average? When we fight taxes, how much we can reduce it like down or bring it down and on average? Am I misunderstand? Maybe I'm not understanding the question. How much can you reduce the taxes when you fight it? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, well, it's a. Um, I'm trying to think how the best answer that. So, um, it really depends on like, like they raised my taxes on one of my deals from like. 10 million to 14 million. It was like a 40% increase. But then I got it from 14 down to 11 and a half. So I I think it just depends a lot because like they're going to, I'll I'll tell you what the the tax protesters do. They're going to ask you for your year end profit and loss statement. So if your NOI is really high, you know, if your NOI shows that, you know, you take the NOI and then there's a cap rate. And if it shows your property is worth 16 million and you're trying to fight it, well, that's a really hard battle. Okay. <clears throat> so like if your NOI is actually suffering, let's say your expenses went up, your taxes went up, or, you know, your insurance went up, your expenses went up, your occupancy went down and you have a legitimate um, value case that says, hey, my property isn't worth it then you have a chance of getting your taxes down. But a lot of times what happens is your property is worth what they say it is on the market or more, (laughs) and you still want to get your taxes down. That's the truth. That's the honest to God truth. How many of you know that? Say I. We want our our market value to be high, but we we want our tax value to be low. And in Texas, they also have a, there's a, uh, and I may get the law, um, may not use the right, words here, but they can also look at equitable values compared to comparable properties. So let's say, Tarek, that you have a property, I have a property, and Alex has a property, and and our properties are similar age and vintage, and we're all in the same sub-market, and yours is at 10 million, and Alex is at 11 million, and mine's at 18 million. Well, the tax advisors could argue to the courts then mine isn't fair and equitable because they could point to yours and they could say, well, hey, this guy's is only 10 and this guy's is 11. Why is my clients at 18? I think it's called like fair and equitable or something like that. And I, and again, don't, I don't want to get caught up on what the, the tax protesting laws are. So they could take a few approaches. They could take your actual value approach by your, your NOI and cap rate. And they could also take a fair and equitable, like a basically a market survey. And they could say, well, hey, these other ones. So like, I'll tell you what they do for mine. My protester, we go to litigation, we protest, we get the number down. If we still think it's too high, then we litigate, meaning we sue the county. And then what they do, I'm just telling you what they do. They wait for the other settlements to come in and that because I'm still emailing them and I'm like, hey, what's going on with my tax lawsuit? And they're like, well, Brad, like we could settle now, but there's like four other cases that are we're going to we're going to hope they settle first. And once they settle, then we're going to use those as a like a case study. And, and so everyone has different tax protesters. So like the, the guy I use, his strategy is. Well, let's wait for everyone else to settle and then we'll see how low they get and then we'll use theirs and then we'll be able to point to theirs and say, well, hey, yours is lower and theirs is lower. So my client should be lower. Yeah. And then and then next year, Tarek, you and I, we have higher taxes. We're like, shit, how that happened? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. No. OK, so. <laughs> all right. Hey, man, th- thanks for the question. And Brad, seriously, thank you for all your time and, and your generosity of spending your vacation time over here with us. 
Um, let me just take us off of spotlight. Everybody can snap a picture, post, uh, tag us on Instagram. Hang on, Brad. Not yet. Let me take us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me remove this. Hold on. Uh, how do I do it? Nick, I'm stuck. I got you. Hold on. Here we go. Everybody see everybody? Okay. So you guys, you know, get on camera, take a picture, tag Brad, tag me, and, um, you know, we'll be able to reshare. And that way we can connect. This is your best way to get noticed on social media and leverage each other at this point. Right? Whoever actually tags me on Instagram, I actually caught friend back. You know, I follow back. So now we have you can leverage my audience, you can leverage Brad's audience, and then we get to build that network. And this is the entire conversation tonight is about team and building network and on relationships. Okay, it's all about relationships. In about two minutes here, we're going to break you guys out into rooms of six. What we're going to do is you guys have these, uh, these uh, icebreaker questions. We're going to do this for about 10 to 12 minutes. You guys are going to get to know each other. I always believe that the Zoom gods, okay, know exactly who to put in what room. It's going to be completely random. All right, definitely do yourself a favor and don't leave and meet somebody that you're meant to meet tonight. So the questions, okay, so if you, whoever is the, the controller in the room, right, you're probably going to want to write this down, is what are you going to implement about in your life from the call tonight? Okay, the second thing is what do you think – the secret to success is number three is going to be what is your hidden talent? And number four is how did you find yourself on this call? All right. And then you guys can share a little bit more about yourself. But those four questions are your icebreakers. I'll just read it one more time is what are you going to implement on the call from the call tonight? What do you think the success to secret is or the secret to success is? And uh, what is your hidden talent? And how do you how did you find yourself on this call? All right. So Nick, you're gonna break everybody out. Take uh, just keep keep Brad in here and and me and you. And um, yeah. And Brad, you don't ha you don't have to hang around. Thank you for 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 uh, for hanging with us. Um, Alex, you know, I appreciate you being here. Us. Hey, you're welcome. I had a great time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll see you in August. We'll see you at the uh, at the event. You're going to be in Florida this weekend. <clears throat> or when are you leaving? Well, I'm not sure. All right. I'll let um, you know because I'm flying to Florida this weekend. Where are you going? Where are you going? So I'll be in the Fort Lauderdale area. We're going to go take a look at one of our other assets up in Fort Pierce as well. All right. Well, I'm, I'm in the Tampa area right now, so I probably uh, won't see you. OK, well, then I'll see you at your event. All right. Sounds great. All right. Cool. Thanks, Brad. All right, All Nick. Right. Send them off. The rooms are open. You can stop the recording too, Alex. Oh. Hi, recording. <laughs>